Welcome back to Bargaining 101. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on why the rich get richer. It's part of Chapter 10 of Game Theory 101 Bargaining. Check the video description for more information on that. Our setup here now is going to be very similar to what we were looking at with the standard Rubenstein bargaining game, with one miter modification. Previously, the actors had identical discount factors. Now we're going to have it so that Albert's discount factor is delta A, and Barbara's discount factor is delta B, and they don't need to be equal to each other. And the reason we're doing this is because in most bargaining situations, two actors are not going to have identical discount factors. You can think about this in a business setting where Albert's business is very desperate to get a deal done, and so he's going to have a small discount factor, whereas Barbara's business is in a great position and they can survive a few days or months or even years without a deal with Albert, and so that's going to make Barbara's discount factor relatively large. And by having these discount factors not be equal to each other, we can actually analyze what's going to happen in this sort of situation. And as we're solving this game, we're going to be adopting the same strategy as we have previously. We're going to be looking for stationary strategies between the players. These are strategies that are not going to change from odd period to odd period or even period to even period. And we'll discuss later on in this course why those are the only solutions to the game. And we also don't have a fixed end to the game because it is an infinite horizon game. So that means we're going to have to start from a generic odd period and work our way back from there like we did when we were solving Rubenstein. So we're still using that same trick and we're still going to have to start off by thinking about some continuation value for Barbara. So let's think about a generic odd period. And if Barbara rejects in this generic odd period, she receives a continuation value equal to VB. That's how much she expects to receive in the next stage if she rejects here in this odd period. Well, in order to get Barbara to accept, Albert needs to offer Barbara her continuation value times her discount factor. Why is that? Well, again, Albert is... If, if Albert makes this unacceptable offer to Barbara, Barbara rejects and gets VB in the next stage. And because there's some time delay between now and then, Barbara's payoff for that next stage is going to be reduced by a factor of her own discount factor, delta B. So that means in order to get Barbara to accept, Albert needs to offer Barbara at least delta B VB. And of course, to get as much of the good for himself as he can, Albert is going to make Barbara's offer exactly equal to delta B VB. This gives Albert the remainder of the good, which is 1 minus delta B VB. And I'm not going to explain why Albert prefers making this optimal acceptable offer to Barbara rather than force Barbara to reject, because the logic is the same as the Rubenstein bargaining game with identical discount factors. So you can go back and look at that video if you need to refresh why it's the case that Albert actually wants to make sure that the offer is accepted here. So that tells us what happens in this generic odd period. We have our payoffs right there. We still don't know what VB is, but we can solve for it in a moment if we start thinking about what happens in the even stage previous to this generic odd stage. So Barbara is the one making the offer here. Barbara knows that if Albert rejects her offer in this stage, Albert will receive a payoff of 1 minus delta B VB. And so to get Albert to accept now, she needs to offer him that amount times Albert's discount factor now. Why is that? Well, again, if you're in Albert's situation, Albert cares about his own discount factor here and how much he expects to receive in the next stage. So if he expects to receive 1 minus delta B VB in the next stage, he's willing to accept anything now that gives him that amount, at least that amount, times his own discount factor. Because again, he's worried about his own patience in this situation. So Barbara is going to make that acceptable offer to Albert. She's not going to give him any more than she needs to because she wants to keep as much of the surplus to herself as she can. And so Albert receives delta A times 1 minus delta B VB, and Barbara receives 1 minus that amount, or 1 minus delta A times 1 minus delta B VB. Now, we still don't know what the continuation value for Barbara is, what VB is equal to, but now we can solve for it very easily, just like we did previously in Rubenstein, because we know that in the period before this even period, if Barbara were to reject the offer that Albert makes her then, 
Barbara receives the amount in the top right corner times her discount factor, which means the amount in the top right corner is in fact her continuation value. So we can use that information to solve for VB. We set VB equal to that value that we saw in the top right corner of the previous slide. And through a whole bunch of algebra, which I'm not going to be doing on screen right here, you eventually get it so that VB is equal to 1 minus delta A divided by 1 minus delta A delta B. All right. Well, now we can take that information and feed it back into the game and figure out exactly what the offer is that's going to happen and what the welfare of those players are going to be as a result of that. So this is shrinking the information from a couple of slides ago. We know that Barbara receives a value of delta B in V, a delta B times VB in any odd period, including the first period, and Barbara accepts that amount. So all we have to do to figure out exactly how much Barbara receives in this game, and by virtue of that also how much Albert receives in this game, is plug VB into the amount that you see in the bottom right corner. And so if you do that, we know that Albert offers delta B times 1 minus delta A divided by 1 minus delta A delta B, and Barbara accepts. That happens in the very first period. Barbara therefore earns that amount, the amount that she's being offered in the first period, and Albert receives the remainder, 1 minus that offer amount. Okay, so now that we know how much the players are earning when they play the game, we can analyze their relative welfare. I'm not going to be doing the fancy calculus on your screen here. You can do this on your own if you want to take a few derivatives or if you want to plug in some numbers and see how this works. But trust me when I say that Albert's payoff is increasing in his discount factor and decreasing in Barbara's, whereas Barbara's payoff is increasing in her discount factor and decreasing in Albert's. Now, this should actually make intuitive sense if we sit here for a moment and think about what this is actually telling us. This is saying that the more patient Barbara is, the better a payoff she's going to get, and the more impatient Albert is, the better that's going to be for her. The first part should be very easy to see why. The more patient you are, the more willing you are to reject some offers, and that of course should result in you getting a better deal for yourself. But when the other side is vulnerable, this means that the other side is more willing to take worse offers for itself, and that in turn improves your own bargaining position. You get to do better because you can force the other side to take less advantageous offers and accept it. So again, you're better off the more patient you are and the less patient your opponent is. Unfortunately, this has some rather disturbing implications, namely the title of the video, The Rich Get Richer. Think about why this is true. Economically privileged actors, we should think, have greater discount factors. Why is that? Well, if I'm a big company that has a whole bunch of money saved up that's just sitting around, I don't really need to make any particular deal right now. My company is not going to go out of business if it doesn't come up with an agreement right away with one of our partners in our business. And so that means I'm going to have a relatively large discount factor when I have all of this money saved up, if I'm a very rich company. Okay, well, what we know from all of the logic that we did previously in this lecture, we know that greater discount factors grant better divisions. And by virtue of the logic that I just gave you, better divisions mean more money today, and that more money means greater discount factors for future negotiations. Not negotiations between these two parties, but a negotiation between me and a third company or a fourth company, and so forth. So you should notice here that there's a bit of a cycle. There's a negative version of this cycle and a positive version of this cycle. The negative version of this cycle is that if you don't have very much money, if you're very desperate to make a deal, you're not going to be getting a very good deal right away, and that's going to be bad for you. It's going to be better for you than not getting any deal whatsoever, but it's not going to be comparatively as good of a deal if you had more money. But that means that you have less money going into the next round of negotiations and so forth. And so you can think about this in two different ways. There's this vicious cycle moral that I just gave you and a virtuous cycle moral, which is probably the one that you should actually be taking away from this lecture, despite this, this negative title, this very negative title of why the rich get richer. So why do I say that we should be focusing on the second, uh, second moral rather than the first moral? Well, 
if the world lacks distributive justice, like I just said, if these individuals who are relatively poor and disadvantaged remain poor and disadvantaged through time, that's very unfortunate. That's not probably how you would want to set up the world if you could change how bargaining works between parties, but that's very difficult to do. The solution, if that is the moral, if that's the takeaway, is to change laws. And maybe that's a good thing. I'm not going to make I'm not going to pass any judgment on whether that's a good thing or a bad thing in this lecture. That's beyond the scope of what I'm doing here. But that's going to be very difficult for a single individual to do, to change a law. And of course, by changing these laws, you might have these perverse incentives that come along with that. But again, not the subject of the lecture here. A takeaway that you can actually use right now in your life is the virtuous cycle takeaway, which is that if you're a rich person, you get richer through time. And so that means what you really should be focusing on if you want to do something for yourself that you can actually affect on your own rather than trying to change a law, the thing that you should be doing is being very careful with your finances to put yourself in a good position as early on in your life as you can because this is going to have a virtuous effect. It's just like compound interest where if you start saving money early in your life, then the interest you receive on that money starts to acquire interest as well. And so you have this accumulative effect over time where not only are you getting money off of the principal amount, but you're getting money off of your interest, and then you're getting money off of that interest, and so forth, where over time you accumulate a ton of money, and so over 34 years you can retire a very happy and healthy life. Same thing goes on here with bargaining. If you put yourself in a good position early on, this is going to give you better deals now, which is going to lead you to get better deals later on, and even better deals after that, and so forth. So if there's one takeaway you should get from this lecture, it's that you should live below your means. If you're overspending, if you're putting more mo or not putting enough money away, you're putting yourself in a position where you're going to be desperate in, say, job negotiations to make a deal as soon as possible, which then in turn hurts your salary, which puts you in a worse bargaining position later on. So the virtuous cycle is what you should be focusing on. Live below your means, save a lot of money, do yourself a favor because this is going to have this cumulative effect just like compound interest in future negotiations. All right, that wraps up this lecture. Hope you enjoyed it and I hope to see you next time. Take care.